Okay, you see presentation and everything. Okay. All right, so uh, my name is Ivan. Uh, I'm an Android developer currently at Stronglift. And today's talk, as you can see, is the title is Ins and Outs of Custom View Development on Android. Now, how much of like the Android can we actually, like of custom view part of Android development can we go through? Uh, it's a different topic, but we'll see. I try to get most of it and uh, basically try to give you like some kind of an insight into both technical and non-technical sides of it. Uh, before I start, I want to give a couple of words about myself, my background, and also about this talk. So in my previous company called PSPDF Kit, um, I did a lot of custom view development. I would say most of my knowledge that I'm presenting today and then where this sli the slides are coming from is actually from that, the work that I did, I did there. Uh, we were working on a PDF framework pretty much. So it's, it had both aspect of very complex custom views with, because you're browsing PDF and it has a bunch of overlays and stuff uh, on top of it. Uh, but also it uh, dealt with users. So people were using it. It's actually a framework. So other developers are using, it's almost like a library. It's a library with a bunch of other things that are on top of it. Uh, and a little bit about this talk. Uh, this talk will be mostly like first part, I wanted to go into a little bit of technical details about custom views. Uh, some of you might be familiar with it. If you ever did it, you're probably gonna know it. Uh, I don't wanna go too deep into it because the idea is not for me to teach you how to write them from this talk, but to give you an insight of how it all works for you to kind of understand it. And then if you wanna, if you ever need to write one, you will definitely need to go through the technical specifications and everything. And also the other part of the talk is uh, a little bit more non-technical, a, a bit about like, when should you write custom views? What are they good for? Um, and all that stuff. And like, sometimes you might even need them when you don't know you need them and so on. All right, so let's, uh, let me start. Let's see if I can do this. Okay. So first, what is view? Uh, in Android, the view is a basic building block for all UI components. Uh, the views are basically objects that represent any kind of visual elements on the screen. Uh, Android system takes all the data that you have for views and the whole view system and the whole, like the whole framework of how it works. It takes all the data, it calculates what needs to be displayed on the screen. And in the end, you get what you see on your phone. Now, two defining properties uh, of views are basically position and visual content. Uh, all of this measuring, laying out views, uh, various different properties that view, that view might ha have, they all basically lead to these two things in the end. We need a position of the view, we need its visual representation. Uh, now on Android system, we have what's called default, what called default views, but it's basically the views that system already implemented for you. And those are most common or most uh, basic UI components that the Android team thinks that people will need to use, developers will need to use uh, in order to create apps. And I would say in 90% of the cases, that's pretty much all you're gonna need. Uh, things like text view, edit text, you all know that image view, button, all default views. Uh, then we have a lot of default views that are extensions of, of, default, of uh, default views like app compat stuff, material stuff, the new things. Uh, we have even combinations of v custom view groups and custom layouts, like custom views and custom view groups, like, like text input layout and text input. So you can see uh, down here, for example, this is the new material guides. I mean, it's not really new, but it's uh, like 2.0 material design. Uh, and all of these little things that you can set on a view, like uh, error text, helper text, trailing icon, the animation when the error occurs, that it goes above the, the edit text field, all these kind of things outlined or filled. Uh, basically, all of these are provided by the material extension of the input of the edit text, which they call text input now. So yeah, they also 
uh, extend some of their own basic stuff. And in DSS, it is a custom view built on top of base view, if you want to look at it that way. Okay, uh, what is the view group? So we talked about views. Now a little bit about the view groups. You also, I'm, I'm guessing you're probably familiar with them as well. Um, a view group is an abstract extension of view class, which means the view group is a view. It just implements additional classes, actually additional interfaces for dealing with child views. So the difference between views and view groups, obviously, is that view groups can contain other views as children. Um, and the two interfaces it implement, implements is view parent and view manager. View manager contains methods like add child, remove child. Uh, you all know they, this like when, I don't know, you want to add a child to a linear layout or whatever programmatically. And uh, view parent has a bunch of methods, most like, I don't know, dispatching request layouts to children. Uh, the whole the whole dealing with the children the, with the child views and how it's all propagated down. So it basically contains all the methods that a view would need to implement on top of the default methods to handle children. Um, if you are uh, extending it, the only abstract method that we, we will need to implement is on layout. So if you if you're directly extending view groups, so you're making your own view group, you only need to extend on layout because uh, that's the only default thing that the uh, implementation doesn't know, like how do you want to lay out your views in this view group? A view group does not have uh, a system to lay out views, so you can't use view group directly. You use, either use like linear layout, relative layout, whatever. They all, they all extend view group. Uh, second thing is uh, layout parameters. Um, you probably stumbled upon them. I stumbled upon them a lot of times, not really maybe realizing every time, uh, especially in the beginning, like what they're used for. Um, but in the end, they're used by views to tell their parents how they want to be laid out. Uh, this is the structure of the view group class. Uh, so the default one, view group dot layout parameters, so uh, interface inside the view group has basically just width and height. And uh, if you know in XML, when you define layout width and layout height, this is basically what it gets created and during the inflation process and it, it's, it's uh, added to the view. I will talk a little bit more about it later. So you will get, you will get a clearer picture of like what happens when you extend the layout parameters and why you should do it and what is their purpose. Uh, moving on uh, now a little bit about default Android view groups. You can see, uh, you all know these ones. Uh, it's the same as with base views. Android system provides some of the most common uh, layouts that uh, that you would need to use inside the app. Uh, view groups are not called layouts. Uh, so linear layout, relative layout, all those stuff. Uh, it's basically like the most common things you will have. You will either, I don't know, display items linearly or I mean, vertically or horizontally in a linear layout, or you would have relations in relative layout or with the new ones like constraint layout, stuff like that. So it's improving, uh, but always you can write your own custom ones. Uh, when it comes to view groups, you don't really need it. Like a lot of times, like you won't really need to write it from scratch. You will see uh, what I'm talking about a little bit later. Uh, but it's not that often to write it from scratch because it is a complex process and you have to think about a lot of things. Okay, uh, some default view groups that extend other default view groups uh, that are provided. Text input layout, as I mentioned, uh, extends linear layout. So it's basically just a wrapper for the text input field um, because there are some animations that go beyond the scope of the view. Like if text moves out of the view, uh, we need some kind of a wrapper. So there's this view group that's used basically as a as a as a wrapper. Uh, each base view group has its own view group layout parameters. Um, again, I'll talk about it a bit later. But basically, default layout parameters have only width and height. And then if you need something more specific like linear layout, linear layout can have gravity, can have uh, weight. Uh, can have orientation. Actually, no, I'm wrong. Orientation is, is its own property. But the views can be uh, can have certain things like weight, like how much weight should it take in a linear layout. So that why, that's why linear layout has additional properties like weight and stuff. 
Okay, uh, now we have XML. So on Android, as you know, you have this XML representation of views. Basically, the whole XML system allows you for expressive creation of view structures, um, as well as integration with Android Studio. So you can like easily drag and drop things. You can see your layouts right away. Uh, when you compile your app, the XML file is compiled into a view and the XML properties set on the view are also available to the view. So it can programmatically fetch the data, fetch the properties set through XML and do whatever it wants with it. Um, and yeah, default attributes are parsed by default view implementations. Now, why do you need custom views? So me personally, I don't really distinguish that much with it types of, within types of custom views. I've seen some some talks even uh, that uh, do some kind of categorizations like we have flat views, which means like views that just draw content, uh, like, I don't know, just a blue circle. That's like a flat view, doesn't have anything. Then you have views that extend, just extend base views. Then you have view groups that, that are extending uh, existing view groups, or you have like everything custom, things like that. In the essence, it's all a custom view. But uh, in most pract in most like apps, uh, in most use cases, you will just pr pretty much you will just need to compose the existing views. That's at least from my experience. We did a lot of other things, which is writing your own things from scratch on my previous job, as I mentioned. And um, so I'm going to show you both sides. We're going to dig into a little bit into the technical aspect, so you can understand how it works. But then you're going to see in application, like what is more useful, in my opinion, in most of the apps. So the first one is, as I said, complex or use case specific UI components, which are not needed in most apps. Some examples are like this, uh, for example, pie charts or any kind of charts. Uh, I know you have a bunch of libraries now, but that's what they do actually. They implement a lot of things in a custom way. They need to take care of uh, resizing. They need to take care of uh, drawing. They need to take care of like calling, like, I don't know, uh, efficient canvas drawing, restoring canvas stuff, all, all the little details it needs to be taken care of. And if you were going to write your own, you would need to understand what you're doing and it will take time. And it's not a simple thing. It's a bit more complex uh, example. Another example is like a Google Calendar. Like if you would want to write that, I, I'm guessing you can just assemble it from the existing views that you have uh, provided by the Android platform, but you would actually need to write your own things and um, probably have a lot of custom, custom views built from the ground up. Now, one example we did uh, in our PSPDF kit app, as you can see, is this uh, toolbar for uh, basically editing PDFs, drawing on PDFs, doing stuff. I didn't actually show you the drawing part here, but uh, you can see it's a very complex structure. Like you can drag it, you can, uh, the, the, the icons will, uh, re will change positions. You can uh, long press to get a sub menu. Then you have a color picker, things like this. Uh, you won't often need in the app. But when you need to, it's a really like it's a complex thing and you need to need some time to develop it. So this talk will mostly give you a little bit of insight into how those things work. But of course, I can't do, do the whole thing or the whole implementation. Um, this one also has a wrapper around it. So as you see, when you're dragging view and it's going sliding into places, there needs to be a parent that's actually controlling the whole flow that's set, uh, like that's positioning, that's laying out the view where it needs to be laid out. Okay, um, second part, which is I think more useful and more common uh, is grouping or composing views for re reusability. Um, it also gives you a higher level APIs. So you don't need to dig into your like uh, complex layout structures and touch each element, but you can create a custom view that's going to have APIs that connect direct uh, connect directly to its children or call some do some logic or whatever, and I think it can be utilized on a lot of apps. And actually, uh, some people mentioned to me that they never had need to use any kind of custom views, um, 
And I don't know, in this case of composing views, I really believe like you can use it in a lot of places where you might not even think you can. Um, okay, so this is one, for example, view I've been working on recently. Uh, and I think it's, you could say it's mostly common thing to have some kind of a subscription in app. This is just an example. Uh, so you can see we have views that are pretty similar here, or in some cases almost equal. And the thing is we want to create a custom view. We want to actually pre present each of these elements as a custom view without having to have all these elements that it has inside. Now I'm going to show you an example here. Uh, let's say you have you have this kind of, okay, these are two elements, but uh, in the code I'm, I'm showing just one. So this is one primitive example of how you can do it. You can have like a card view. I mean, probably more optimized would be linear layout with a better background, but let's say you, put, you have a card view and then in a linear layout, you put title and description, and then you have an image view for the check mark and you have a text view for the price. Now, let's say you need, as in this example, you need like five or six of those you definitely don't want to have this done 10 times or like duplicated. So, uh, and also if something changes, you're going to need to change all of them. So you want to have something, let's say like this, uh, some clearer structure when you can, that you can duplicate. And then you can also set things like you can uh, put the theme on it. You can put you can stylize it. So they're all looking the same. Uh, you can have custom, attributes like you can see down there title text description text price it's per is purchased like a boolean flag so if it's purchased it's going to show a check mark if it's not it's going to show a price so you can incorporate all of that into your custom view and that custom view will not be so complex as you will see later i will implement something similar like this um, okay, before we go further, I want to go through the measure layout draw, the whole life cycle of creating custom views. If you ever did, did create custom views, you've probably seen a bunch of blog posts on this topic. And I wouldn't say it's, it's probably not complex as it looks, uh, especially if you have to manipulate something there, it can be, you can get stuck a little bit, but you probably won't have to write anything from scratch like that because it, it is complex thing you will see uh you will see in a minute i will talk a little bit also about default implementations and how they do it on android system um, so all these are executed in top-down recursive uh, traversal of the tree uh if you don't know the views in in uh, android have this hierarchical structure where the window is on top and then the root view and then you have like status status bar on a different side of the tree so all the views are represented through this tree uh, and view groups have their children inside, which all can also be view groups. Um, and all of these three uh, calls in both measure uh, layout and draw are getting uh, starting from the top and going down. So every view is pushing their own specs down. They're laying out the views inside of them. And in the end, they're dispatching the draw calls, giving them the canvas to draw the content on. Uh, so, okay, a little bit about the measure call first. So the measure call is handled in the on measure call. Uh, each view dispatches dimension constraints to children via measure spec or measure specifications class. Uh, measure spec is basically an integer actually. Uh, if you've ever seen it, don't be confused. It's uh, actually a flag. So if you know how bit shifting works on in Java or Kotlin, um, it's basically just it just stores all the data it needs in a, in an integer. Uh, it has two values that it's storing, uh, a size in pixels, or you'll see like it can give you an exact number. It can hold exact number, or it can hold match parent or wrap content con uh, constants. Uh, and it also has a mode. Mode is either unspecified, it's at most, or exactly. Unspecified mode would mean uh, the, when, when, when we call on measure on the view and give it unspecified, it means it can be as big as it wants. Uh, if you give it at most, it means it can be at most this size, but it can be less than that. And if you give it exactly, it's uh, obvious um, the view should have should be exactly that size. Now, each view, in order to even be valid, needs to have uh, dim measure dimension set and it can set its dimensions through set measure dimensions call. 
so once the view called set measure dimensions, it will put its own width and height like that it measured that it should be. And then we can, we can fetch it through get measured, measured width and get measured height. That's different from get width and get height, which are actual width and height of the view. So let's say the view is in the measuring process and it's still not displayed on the screen. Get width and get height will be zero because there's, the view still doesn't exist. Like once it exists, then you can get, the, like those values can differ. They don't have to be the same. Yeah, like the view can say, I measured, I want to be 300, but you can force it to be 100 and then get width will be 100. Um, this is this might look a little bit complex, but uh, I'll try to explain to exp explain to you uh, how you can resolve this. Now I wrote a little bit simpler resolve size method. So when you get uh, you get a measure spec from the parent, you want to decide like the view wants to decide. It needs to calculate basically what I was talking about. It's measured width. It's measured height. So. Uh, First thing is you can use these two static methods, measure spec, which will have get mode and get size, uh, basically helper methods for pulling uh, the data from the flagged integer. Um, and then from then we can construct the actual size of the views. So what this method, when this method is going to be called, you can see the first, first parameter is content size in the method, which means we're going to get the all measure call the parent's going to request the ch its child to measure itself. The first, you, it's going to go through its own children. It's trying to figure out how big it needs to be. So let's say you have three views. You want to check how, how big are they. And then you're going to have a content size. And then you're going to push that content size as well as, as, well as the measure sp uh, specification. You can see both of them in the arguments. And you're going to try to f figure out from what you got from the parent and what you got from the children, you're going to figure out what's the, what's the final size going to be. We're going to pass this, uh, we're going to call this method for both width and both and height. Um, then you can see the next part is you will look at the mode that we got and we got, we got three cases. If it's exactly, we're just going to return the size, the size that we got from measure spec, not the content size that we calculated we need. So the parent is requesting us to be exactly this size. This is the size we're going to measure uh, or report as measured. If we got at most, we're going to look if the content size spans above uh, the size, then we're going to use the size from the measure spec. If it's less, we're just going to use our content size because it's not going over the limit. And the third one is if it's unspecified, we're just going to use our content size because there's no limitation from the measure specs and it's going to show like uh, we're going to just use as much space as we want. Um, now, if we look at on measure call, this is how we look when you override it in the view um, and you use it to figure out, as I said, content width of, uh, and height. For example, by measuring children, it, you don't have to respect you don't have to respect children. You can just be whatever size you want, but I guess in most of the implementations, you will want it. Um, so here I have three dots, but I will show you an example later. Here we will calculate the content that we need for this view, and then we're gonna put it to the to the call to the method that I just shown. And we're going to find out the width size and height size, basically, or I should better call it measured width size and measured height size, because that's what we're going to report in the end to the measured dimension. OK, uh, a little bit about two other calls that I will focus on the layout one. The draw one is the story for itself. So I will just tell you what it is. I won't go into examples right now because it's most, mostly about dealing with Canvas which it is a view thing, but I think if you go, ever go into it, you're going to look at all the APIs. Um, so for layout, uh, the layout is handled in on layout calls. So when you go, get on layout calls, call, it means that the view is getting laid out and that it needs to lay out its children or its content. Uh, so as it says here, this is where the parent should position its children. Uh, when you're overriding on layout, each child is positioned with layout call. Uh, by providing the boundaries relative to the parent itself. So now this is the final call. This is uh, the, the parent has decided 
where should each of the child of the children go, where they should be positioned. And in the good implementation, it will respect the size of the children, but it can also set its own rules. Uh, for example, let's say you have a linear layout and you put, I don't know, it, you, you set its size to 300, then, in, then you put five children of 100. Obviously, they can't all fit, even though they measured 100 as their width. Uh, when you're laying them out, you're just going to put three, other two won't fit, and then uh, the layout, linear, for example, linear layout will have its own logic for determining how to figure out those other two. You will probably just squeeze the last one and the other ones are cut off or, or depending on the, on the implementation of which layout you're using. Um, and the draw part is handled in on draw call. So each of the views will get this call eventually if they're visible, if they're actually, if they actually have to draw something. There's a whole system uh, inside uh, that's using the dispatch draw call. So basically the view group is the one that's drawing first and then it goes down the hierarchy, the views are drawing on top of each other. So the, the lowest element in, elements in the, in the tree are, are gonna draw the last, which kind of makes sense because if you have a layout, you have buttons, those are children, so you want the layout first uh, to be drawn and then each of the children. And they will get just the canvas uh, depending on their size. They don't know where this canvas is gonna be positioned. The parent will position the view somewhere, but he's the, here's the canvas so he can draw on. And that's, that's the only thing it knows. It can get like canvas width and height. But as I said, I won't go too much into drawing stuff because you rarely do it and it's really a complex thing. I might mention it later. Okay, so I'm burning time a little bit. I'll try to speed this up. So um, an example I'm going to do, which is stu super stupid, I would say, and probably not usable, but just to give you an insight of how things can work, is I'm going to make what's called what I call fitting toolbar. Let's say this is a custom view, and this will be the rules for it. Uh, it's a simple toolbar that will only show the items that fit within its width and height. Uh, if set to wrap content, the toolbar will adjust to the dimension of the children. Um, it will try to place items horizontally in the order they were added. Um, if the item does not fully fit into the toolbar, it will not be shown. So we have two items and third one doesn't fully fit, we won't show it. Um, if the item does not fit, but let's say the next item fits, we're going to show that one. So you can almost think of it like a like squeezing all the other ones in the overflow. In some more advanced implementation, you could have an overflow button. So everything that doesn't fit in the toolbar, you can put push in the overflow. And if there are some items that are larger than the other ones, you still wanna use as much space as possible by putting the smaller ones first and then having other ones in the overflow. Um, and I added one th thing just for fun, the height of the tallest toolbar item will dictate the heights of other elements. I mean, usually you will have unified items this way i just wanted you to be able to add any kind of view as an item so if one view that's in there is large i want the whole toolbar to be large and all the items to be large so it doesn't look like off like one small and one large you'll see in the implementation okay and this is basically what i want to have i want to have a fitting toolbar which is a view group and then i want to have like just i, I can just add uh, views inside and I want them to be displayed in the view as shown below. So you can see this is the, like the first two, two uh, toolbars are the same one. It's just that the second one is, long, uh, is larger. It's, it has a larger width, so all the elements are fitting in. Uh, and the first one just copies fitting in. And in the third one, you can see like paste is too large. It's a high button. It has a bigger height. So like the whole toolbar and all the other elements are expanded. So let's check out the code and maybe I will bring, uh, I, you will better understand how, from technical side, how measuring works. Um, so for example, for this view, uh, you get call on measure, you get width measure specs and height measure specs from the parent. You, you set the content height is zero, content width is zero. So you're starting to, tr to figure out how big is the content, how big the content needs to be. The next thing is you start iterating through the children views. So for each child, you get the, you get the child, you measure it. Now, in this case, 
not not to have a too complex example, uh, I just use unspecified. So I would say to the child, to the child, you can be as big as you want. I pass zero, but you can pass pretty much any value because it doesn't matter. It's just going to use its own content. And then um, once this is when this call is over, the child needs to have its dimension set. So we'll have set measure dimension called. And then I can call, I can figure out its measured width and its measured height. So I can say content width, uh, I would just add this child to the content width and I, I will do it in the for loop. So I'm, I'm, I'm incrementing the content width and for content height, I'm basically doing the max. So I'm looking, what is this view the largest one so far? And if it is, this is the new content height. Um, right, so when we get out of the for loop, we have this content height and width figured out. And then we just push them through the, through the method resolve size simplified that I actually showed you before. Uh, we push the content width, the content height, as long uh, uh, together with their specs. So depending on what the parent this, uh, has, what constraints it put on this view, the final width size and height size values will be figured out. And we set that as measured dimension. This is for this toolbar. So this is toolbar's measured dimension. Uh, why I call this simplified? Because Android has its own resolve size, uh, which is too complex to show. It has a bunch of other things like minimal size, like maybe button never wants to go below some minimum size. So we'll so there will be some kind of uh, processes there. I mean, if you look at the code, it's uh, like almost like I don't know, 100 lines or something. It's a complex thing. So we I didn't want to go too deep into it, but just implement a simple one for resolving size. Okay, and now we have get to the on layout call. Now we have to lay, lay out those views, those uh, ch children. So this call with, will, you will get this call whenever there's a layout process and it's called on the toolbar. Um, so we can say max width. So we never want to go above the measured width of this, of this toolbar. Um, now I set the variable taken width. You can say taken space width or something like that. This is where we're going to figure out how much space is already taken and if the next view will fit into this. So again, we go through the children, we figure out, we, we iterate through the children. And for each child, we check if the taken width, so the, the width that was taken so far, if we add the child's measure width, will it go over the max width? And if it wouldn't, then we lay out this child. We actually put it in the toolbar. And how we lay out it? We just call child.layout. Uh, and these, uh, these parameters in the dot layout call are left, top, right, and bottom uh, relative to the parent. So we're going to put it to the taken width, which will be like, like left portion will be how much is already taken. Top will be zero. Right will be taken width plus the child's measured height, measured width, and the button will be the height, height of the toolbar. Uh, and finally, we will increment the taken width. So we know we added this view and then we increment. In the case that this doesn't uh, fill the, the condition, so the view, the the menu item doesn't fit into the into the toolbar, which is gonna call layout 0000, which means the view will not even be shown there. It will be just um, and this is what you get. For example, I added this slider where with the slider, I'm pretty much, uh, I'm actually controlling the width of this toolbar. So you can see in implementation, first, if you look at the top toolbar, as there's no space for items, they just get removed. As soon as there's space, they get added. Now you can see an interesting thing in the bottom one is that like, now paste, if it gets lost because it's too large, the, the search will jump in. So it will, it will show search because there's enough room for search. But once there's enough room for paste, it will show that one uh, first and then search because we wanna, we wanna do it um, like in a list as we, as we provide them. Okay, uh, one thing about this screen, so I'm gonna show you how I did it. Um, this is the listener from the progress bar. And you can basically see how did I change the, how did I, I will open it all, okay. So I will show you how did I change the width. So I basically have this fitting toolbar one and two, and uh, 
as I move the progress, I just set the progress uh, value to be its width. And there's no set width call on it. So you have to do through layout parameters because layout parameters actually tell the parent, as I described earlier, how big the view want to be. So if you say fitting toolbar one dot layout parameters dot width, set it to progress and do the same for the toolbar number two, uh, that means the next time the request, the, the layout process goes to, uh, like happens, the, the width of it will be larger. Uh, at least it will request a larger width. And in the end, I call fitting toolbar one dot request layout. I just call it on fitting toolbar one because request layout call j goes to the root. So it doesn't matter which view requested the layout, uh, changing one view uh, view size expects, like the system expects potentially all of the views to change. So the whole hierarchy. So it goes all the way up to the root and the request and the layout calls are pushed down and they all get resized. So you don't need to call it on, on the second toolbar or you can call it on any other view. It will happen. The whole process will happen. Uh, now each view can hold its layout parameters, which can be accessed to get layout parameters. As I said, uh, the upper example is just using Kotlin like getter syntax, so there's no get. Uh, and return layout parameters are always of type view group dot layout parameters. And if you want the ones for the particular implementation, you will need to cast them. Now I didn't cast anything in the upper example because my layout parameters I, you get an interface, which you get just a, uh, layout parameters class, which is, if I'm not mistaken, it's interface, it's a abstract class. So it contains already width and height, and I didn't need anything specific. Now, if I wanted to change the gravity and I'm in a frame layout, I would need to cast the frame layout, uh, layout parameters first, and then call gravity. As you can see in the bottom one, like uh, here, you can see uh, all the casts, for example, I, can, I mean, there's a, more of them. I'm just showing some examples. For example, if you cast a linear layout, uh, layout parameters, then you have weight. If you cast relative layout, you have things like align with parent, gravity for frame, constraint layout has constraint width, uh, coordinate layout has a key line and all of that. Now be careful, this can fail. This is casting as always. Uh, so you need to be aware of where, like what's the parent of that view but you will in most cases know, most cases know that. Um, and when it comes to view invalidation, there are two methods that are most uh, known. It's a view invalidate and view request layout. Invalidate will just redraw that one view. So let's say you change the background color, and but it's in your own implementation. You need to call invalidate so you get on draw again. Uh, Android like base classes do that by itself. So when, whenever you call set, like on text view, if you call set color, it will actually call the invalidate. Um, and request layout will basically do what I, what I explained previously, just call the whole thing. Uh, the whole thing will lay out again. Okay, now before the second example, I'm just gonna go quickly to the view constructors. There are four of them. You've probably seen this already. Uh, we never really know what the last two are for, right? Uh, so you pretty much need the only first two in most of the cases. I would say the third and fourth are if you're writing a library or something more complex, so that needs style, styles and teams. Uh, I can give you a quick example. We did, uh, we, we always implemented all four of them if, if our users needed to use it. So uh, the first one, I'll go through them here. So the first one with just the context can only be used programmatically. It can't read XML, so it can't do any kind of inflation. This is for the views that I, you're gonna instantiate only programmatically and you won't care about XML or all, all that stuff. Second one, give you attribute set of the attributes that were set on it so you can read through form XML and you can actually like uh, read those values and apply them to the view. And the last two are mostly called by superclasses to provide default styles or themes. Uh, for example, if you're writing a library and you have a view and you want to have a default theme set to it, this is going to be the third parameter, uh, default style attributes. So th these are default attributes that it's going to read from the XML and it's going to apply to the view. And the fourth one is the one that let's say someone else is using that view and they want to overwrite some things. So they're adding their own styles there. So they're attributes, their properties will be applied on top of yours. This is that fourth one. Uh, it's a bit 
I mean, the fourth one is uh, API 21 plus, if I'm not mistaken, but uh, yeah, most of the times you won't need them unless you're writing something specific. All right, second example, I'm already 40 minutes, I'm sorry. Uh, it's a bit longer, I'll try to speed it up. Um, this is the most practical uh, use case. Uh, this is, let's say we're building a setting screen or something, and we have views like this one, where we have title, we have a description, it can be just title, it can be without description, or it can be, or it can have some things like toggle, uh, which I use the switch here. Now, it would be cool as well, again, to have one view to this to to describe this each of the elements. So, um, this is what this is how you would actually implement it, and this is the example I want to show you for the most use cases that you were actually going to need it. Uh, first, you would make, you can simply make uh, XML layout for that view. You can see in this example, I don't know how big is this, if, if the code is big enough, but basically here I have a linear layout that contains title, description, and a switch. It's just the same one, the same thing as you would do with your own views. Uh, you can define custom attributes, so you can change like title text, description text, and whether to show switch or not. You can specify them so you can control them directly from XML without having go, to go to the API. And then in the implementation, here I just extended framework, frame layout. I know you can always optimize it, do kind of a, like uh, you can just merge the, the layout in and all of that, but that's a story for a different day. Right now, I just use the frame layout, so there's nothing inside. Uh, and then I pretty much inflate this XML file. I put this frame layout as a root of it, and through find, by ID, find view by ID, I pull out all these views that are inside, like title, description, and switch. And then you can call this obtain style attributes method that's in the context uh, class where you can give it attributes and you can give this styleable that you uh, that you um, that you defined uh, so it basically allows you to pull out all the values so you can see i'm setting title text i'm setting description text i'm setting the switch visibility and in the end you always have to recycle it uh, because it's meant to be used just once and it needs to release all kinds of basically it's called it's holding a lot of things so you need to to let it go. Uh, I would say that this method high description view with no content because uh, if there's no description, we don't want title to be up, but we want it kind of to be in the middle. So we want to set visibility to gone if the description is empty. And then as an API, you can add all these methods that are kind of familiar to you. So that's for programmatic use. You don't need if you're just going to use for XML, but these are like set title text, set description text, set switch enable true or false so it's basically mimicking the android system and it's calling uh, its children it's setting things on its children okay and then in the end this is the end product this is how your xml can look if you you took all these this complex structure and put it into uh, a custom view then what you need to do is you need just to just to line up this setting item views you can set uh, description text you can set whether to show switch or not you can say title text uh, it's all here it's all visible if you change something everything changes if you reposition something everything repositioned uh, and i believe you will have a lot of times a component that can be that you're going to reuse and that you might want to change or might want might need uh, like higher abstraction levels like you need higher api higher level apis so i think this is useful for almost all apps Okay, so this was the technical part. Now a little bit of like my just, I get I guess rants um, from the experience. Um, I don't have much time, but I will try to be fast. So before you write a custom view, think about it. Um, I, guess, uh, I guess most of these advices will apply to just general programming, but I try to keep it simple to, I try to keep it uh, more tied to custom views. Uh, first question you need to ask yourself, do you really need it? where it will be used, should it be modular or lot modular, whatever, you know what I'm trying to say. Uh, so like a view can have some other view inside that you might use as well. So you might think, should that be a custom view before I go up or should everything just be one huge custom view? Uh, will it be used on the product project or, or as a library? So if you're using it just internally, you know you're not going to misuse it. You're not, you know you're, not, you're just going to use it for a simple thing or whatever. It doesn't need to implement all these things. 
but if it's a library, it's a different story. Um, you would like to stay close to the Android platform as possible, API-wise. So instead of now, like you don't want to call things. If it's set text, you want to call set title. You don't want to have, I don't know, something else. You want to keep the syntax. You want to keep the style. You want to keep the simplicity. Uh, and basically do the same, do it in the same manner that Android API does it. Um, it's also okay to prototype first. You can prototype and then you can, you can just use, you can duplicate, just copy paste code if you need at first and then see, oh, this is useful. We can make this a custom view because sometimes it will be a lot faster than starting to write a whole custom view, testing it, and then maybe figuring out you don't really need it in the end or something big changed and you just need to throw it away. So make sure you need it first and then you kind of want to extract it if you want to avoid duplication and all that. Um, try to keep them in non-breakable state, which means like, let's say you're displaying a list of items. This view should work even if no items are provided. So the, I, the view has only four constructors. You can't have constructor with the list. So it will have a setter, but means it's an immutable, it's in the mutable state and it needs to be handled like that. So if there's no list, it should just not have no children, but it shouldn't crash. Um, Avoid premature optimization of view layers. Uh, views are not that expensive. Trust me, I, I thought uh, views are super expensive. All the view recycling thing that was being pushed and view holder patterns and all that, it's all great. And I agree, it's a great thing, but um, views are not that expensive, especially if you have like just one linear layout above other linear layout, which is extra. And then if you're gonna spend like hour to remove it and uh, to have one layer less, I think it's, uh, I mean, if you have time, go for it, and it's definitely an improvement, but it's not that big of a deal. Don't think about it as a big of a deal. Um, try to make views a single purpose. Uh, if you make them too flexible, which we did a lot of times, I have to admit, it's kind of a headache a little bit later to manage because it can break in so many ways. Okay, from technical things that I didn't mention, this is what I want to add. So first, do not chain, chain view constructors. Uh, if you've seen, there's a four of them. You should just, from each one of them, you should go to the init call. Kotlin has it by default, uh, and it will be called after the constructor. In Java, you will have to do it manually. Never chain them because sometimes they secretly insert some defaults. For example, if you provide null to the text view as an attribute set, or like a style, I'm not sure anymore. I remember that back in the days. It will act, the Android system will actually give its own defaults. So you're getting something under the hood that you're not aware of, and the end result might be different than you hope for. Um, understand styles and themes system for proper usage. It's a bit complex system, but once you understand it, it's really not that hard. And I think it's uh, it's amazing. You can you can do great things. Like you can have theme switch from light to dark in like a matter of seconds, like just code wise, you just d define colors and switch it. It's super simple. It's super nice. But a lot of times I've seen it misused so many times. Uh, third thing, invalidate with post invalidate, post invalidate on anim animation. If you just call invalidate, the redraw is going to happen right away on the main thread. So you kind of want to remove that off the main thread um, and let it let the system handle it in its own time. Um, of course, there's a state restoration, which I didn't get to, but all the views on Android that have ID will get this on restore uh, instant state and unsave instant state calls so that it allows them to, to restore state. So if, I don't know, you put something in the edit text field, you you rotate the, the, the screen, it should remain there. And if you have some, so if you're extending edit text, that will be handled. But if you're not, if you have some custom data that needs to be uh, retained, you're going to need to implement those too. Um, animations, that's a whole nother different thing. Um, I just wrote two things, try to avoid callback hell. You have a bunch of libraries, a bunch of approaches where you can basically pull it, pull it out of the callback. So if you need, I don't know, three, in, animate three views in a, in a sequence, you don't want to go into three callbacks. You have, I don't know, you can probably use now calling the routine, uh, coroutines or the, uh, RX Java libraries or whatever. Uh, to kind of pull them out and have it in a like a single chain. And the second thing is track state change requests as if they're immediate. I did this error a lot of times where, I don't know, you would try to show a view with a fade in and then you would set it to visible after the fade in is done. 
you should set it to visible right away and run the fade in animation on its own. Because what you're going to get if you want to fade in, but then start fading back out uh, while the animation is still ongoing, this won't happen because you will still be shown as not visible. So you basically just restart this animation. This happened like a million times and it should always, the state of the view should be on the sync, on, like in, on the synchronized flow. It should never depend on any async processes. Handling touches, that's a whole different story. Be very careful with that system. The Android system does it very well. Uh, basically children, the top views get, get the touches. If you need something, um, something custom or harder, then it's going to be hard and you really need, I would try to understand how it all works first and then go into an implementation. Um, drawing, heavy graphical resource use. Um, we have a bunch of those with bitmaps, with uh, just a bunch of views getting created. So we did a lot of recycling, we basically pull out the view and the recycler class, whatever it is, and then just get it back again. As I said, creating views is not that super expensive, but if, if you have this kind of thing, you will need it. These are all like more advanced things that you will, if you ever come up uh, to the point that you need them, you're gonna look into them anyways. Uh, and finally, writing a view library, I'm sorry. So if you're actually writing a library uh, about with custom views, you wanna care about documentation. That's, I guess, for every library. Uh, you want to stay even closer to the Android API system. People are used to using Android views and they want to use your library in the same way. They don't have, they don't really want some crazy builder patterns or sometimes it's, it's necessary, but you, you want to try to avoid it and try to keep it clean. Um, of course, the XML support, I've seen a bunch of libraries that are just programmatic and sometimes it's just hard because then you have to actually, maybe you have a class that just uh, XML, you want to just put it there, but then you have to actually uh, inflate it and go in there and inject it. It's, it's not really like a nice experience. So XML support is always a nice thing. Of course, it'll allow custom styling, provide defaults. I already mentioned that. Use all constructors, yeah. Uh, handling configuration changes, state restoration, I mentioned that as well. Your, your, your view should do it if you're doing a library. And have a clear purpose. Uh, that's one of the most important ones, although it seems kind of trivial. Um, a lot of times people will want to misuse your views, trust me. I've, I've seen more tries of a misuse than actually correct use. So. Uh, Weird things can happen. They can break them in so many ways. They can actually, actually was surprised that they can use them in so many ways that they're, they're not meant to be used, but yeah. Um, so do not add features if someone requests it. Like someone will say, I just want to put some button in there. Can you enable it? And then you do something generic there. And from there, it just snowballs into a completely flexible view that it's not clear what this purpose is. So try to keep it simple and yeah. Sorry for taking so much time, 53 minutes. I thought it was gonna be like 30, but um, yeah, that's for me. I need headphones now. Thank you, Ian. Great talk. So well, when we talked about this talk, before you present, you said the time of the day. You're very not sure we will it's not material to show here, but as you can see, you showed a lot, and I'm sure many of us came here and learned new stuff, so thanks for that. Uh, as I noticed, we have a lot of questions piled up and queued up, so if you'd like, we can go through all of them so you could answer them. So the first one, what are your thoughts on Jetpack Compose and Motion Layout? I'm sorry, I started reading some other one. Okay. Uh... Yeah, well, it's the same, I guess, with the Swift UI on iOS. It's still an early phase. Uh, I like them in a way. I've built some of my custom views really quickly, uh, especially with the new ones. Not this one. Uh, it's a constraint, constraint layout. Uh, I like the concept. Uh, I do also love XML to some degree. I know people say XML is so, I don't know, like uh, worn out and all of that, but it really gives you Sometimes it really gives you a powerful thing, things. Um, you can really implement things quickly. And 
I don't know. It's kind of clear to me when I look at it, what's happening. I don't like I, it can, it separates me from the programmatic side. So I can write it there and just use it there. Uh, but I like the new concepts and if they show useful, I'm, de I'm definitely looking forward to using them. I know it's still like early for, for it to go to the production. Cool. Thanks for answer. Okay. Number of options is asking, are there any performance aspects that developers should, should take care of when developing custom use? Uh, I would say mostly you won't need to handle anything. I, uh, if you're doing something more advanced, like, I don't know, we did like, uh, you have basically scrolled through PDF pages and each page is a big image and uh, pages need to be recycled. Uh, it all needs to work uh, seamlessly in a way, but it's doing a lot of reading and writing in the background. Then you really need to take care of it. But from the simplest perspective of custom views, I don't really see anything outside of like maybe just bitmaps because none of the regular objects are that heavy that will cause you like a big like big problems. Uh, we did have problems when I was implementing compute scroll method, which is like the method get, that gets called a lot of times when you're like scrolling and you need to, to position, figure out the position in each moment, then you might get into the loop where this just, just gets called too much and the things like that. So maybe just that, but uh, yeah, in your regular stuff and in the example I showed the last, uh, you probably won't, won't have these issues. Okay, we can mark this then as answered to the next one. Uh, was there any way to not showing the child its stand or layout? Yeah, the whole example, you shouldn't use it at all. You should just use uh, like, <laughs> you, could, you should just like extend linear layout. And when it comes to those views, you should just, uh, uh, just set visibility to gone because then linear layout handles it itself. I'm not sure how does it handle. I mean, it's still, the view is still there. Uh, I just use this sort of like a trick to get rid of like any kind of additional logic I would need, but, uh, yeah, I'm not, I'm not really sure. I will have to check how other like layout implementations do it because yeah, I'm not sure if, if that call is necessary, but if you don't, yeah, uh, I don't know. I would, I would have to see. Hey, you know what the problem was in, like in this example, if you lay it out, you, you call layout once and then you shrink the view, it won't disappear because you already call layout. It's there. And then you need to tell it again. Now I want you to not show basically. So you kind of have it laid out once. And then once it's shrinking, you want it to disappear. You just call layout to zero, zero, zero and like remove it like that. So. Yeah. Maybe there's a better solution. I, I, I would have to look at it, but I don't think this is this will cause any problems. Yeah. Uh, can you share the code samples afterwards? There are quite some in interesting parts in your code that I assume many of us would, would be interesting in take a look. So. Yeah. Well, I mean, sure. I mean, you will have a presentation. Uh, my codes are not that much more than what you saw. I put a lot of code into it, which I don't like, but I couldn't like uh, really remove any. But yeah, I can maybe make a gist or something in a day or two. Yeah, cool. Okay, next one. Uh, how can you decide whether you want to embark on the journey of implementing your own U bus using X uh, library? It happens that there is some small feature that no library implements, but you're not uh, sure whether it's worth the time to do it yourself. Yeah. Uh, so it's always a problem with any library, I guess. It's always a question, should I write this myself? Should I do it with a third party library? Um, when I look at libraries, I always go through the source code a little bit. I look at a lot of things like how often is it contributed to, how often does the bug fixes happen, how much uh, the issue tracker is, at, how active is the issue tracker and all of these things. So you basically get a clearer picture of how well maintained is. Uh, because in the end, if you go with third party library, you pretty much depending on someone else uh, doing like keeping it up to date and if they break it or just don't work on it anymore or don't, don't update it, the newest uh, Android APIs or whatever, it's just not going to work and it's just going to force you to do it later. Uh, if it's something too complex, I always go with the third party library first. So let's say you need some graphs, maybe like a complex graph. You're definitely not going to waste three months because someone maybe took three or six months to write it. 
So you're going to take a library, but then if you find some time in the future, you can try to write your own or you can just replace it maybe with someone, something else. But yeah, it's, 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 it doesn't have a clear answer, I guess. Yeah, I, I can add up to this. For example, in one of my past projects, we used the expandable toolbar. That's, that's the library that many people use, but at some point they deprecated it. So what we did, we just copy, copied the part of the library that we used and we maintained it ourselves. So we could probably uh, maybe continue maintaining the library instead of that guy, but it would probably be a lot more time time consuming for us and answering all the questions. So, okay, to the next one. How do you ensure custom views are accessible? I assume you're here talking about accessibility framework, uh, accessibility API of the Android. Well, I'm not sure. It might be how they're accessible through code. Like they're handled, if that's the question, they're handled, they're handled the same as all the other views. So as soon as you write them, you can add them to XML, the same as any other view. Uh, if you're talking about the accessibility, that's also a different topic. It has the whole API that you have to uh, pretty much go through. A lot of the components that are provided by Android by default have accessibility uh, already handled. So like, thing, like things like you can focus uh, buttons, you can move around with the keyboard, or I don't know what, what are all the accessibility features. Uh, but otherwise, you just need to look into the accessibility API. But if it's just about accessibility through the code, it's pretty much as any Android view. You just import it and use it. Cool. The, the next one is a shout out to your work in, on PDF app viewer, I assume. Uh, yeah. I noticed some fancy toolbar in that PDF app. There is possibility of dragging. I'm always struggling to, with scroll and dragging in custom views. Do you have any resources or recommendations for this problem? Uh, it's a hard one. It's a, first, it's not, it's not a really easy thing to implement. You will need some kind of a view group. I would recommend, so first of all, you need, you need a parent, you need a view group around the view. View cannot drag itself. So you need some layer that will basically move it around. Now, for example, for this toolbar we did, we actually have a huge view group that spans across the whole screen, but it's on top of everything and it's transparent. It, the, view, the touches go through it, so you can touch the page even though the view is there. And it's, it's, uh, the toolbar is its child, and you can move it around. Uh, the moving, movement logic is basically like, I don't know, in simplest form, you can take a frame layout. And then as you move, as you drag, you need to, it's basically math, but you need to calculate where do you want to position it, and then just position it physically with, through that, that layout call. Um, like on X, Y, pretty much just that. Like, I don't know if you can use anything more sophisticated for stuff like that. Unless it's just like fixed, fixed animation. I don't know. I want to move it from here to here. But if you're dragging with a finger, you're always going to need something. And what we did is like, you can pretty much have this view above it. And once you click on the view and you want to drag it, you remove that view from its own parent and put it into this view. So it has a new parent. And then you move it, and once you drop it, you get its position and you put it back into the parent, something like that. But it's not the simple solution, yeah. Yeah, it sounds like, like some dark magic. <laughs> yeah, it sounds like months of month work. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, good job on that one. Yeah, I, I also really liked it. Okay, the next question then would you recommend choosing custom views instead of using the nested views in XML? Well, obviously, if you're using them too much, uh, you need to see how complex the implementation would be. Um, like when I did this settings view that I just show you, uh, first I was I would just have them nested and have them nested all the way through. But then you have to figure out if it like if it's it's if it's very static, then you might not need a custom view. It looks better, but if it's too sta if it's static and you're not going to change values that much or uh, programmatically touch it then it's fine. But if you're going to touch it a lot, then you always have, you, you will have to go deep. So you, you will have to go uh, off, find me the, the text view of this, like file. every text you will have its ID. You will have instead of one ID for the whole view and one API, you will have like five IDs for just this one section. Uh, so the, the code will, will get ugly. So if you can do it easily and you use it a lot, I will definitely go for it. I mean, you can always try to do one and see how the, the complex process it looks to you, how complex is the process to you. So, yeah. 
Okay. Uh, do you use data binding with custom views? What is your opinion about that? Yeah, I I used it. Uh, it's just uh, uh, with with custom view, I didn't actually. I didn't. I just inflated it manually. I don't know how it works. I used it with activities fragments. I mean, your view, your custom view also gets pulled into the view binding. Uh, but I'm fine with it. I think it's just a code generation thing for easier fetching. Uh, in the end, I guess it wraps around all the usual stuff. So, yeah, I'm fine with using it. And we have the last question. Uh, wouldn't you always use the merge element when you're inflating the view into custom view group? In that case, you don't have, as in this example, in out nested between the real real layout. Yeah, I actually mentioned that. Uh, I just use it to show it, uh, not to have too complex things to make it easier for the presentation. And that's what I was mentioning when I said, uh, like premature optimization of few layers is sometimes my lead to problems. So I think if you like, if you have time for it, definitely go and do it. It's definitely going to remove a layer. Uh, it's even like, you can even argue I shouldn't use two linear layouts. I can use one frame layout and just position them manually. It's even better. Uh, or have constraint layout and have all the elements aligned in. But I guess constraint layout has a bit more com complex calculations. Um, yeah, you, can, you should definitely do it. Uh, but I think optimizing views is almost like a different talk. Well, I can see in chat, yep. That's the last one. So we came up to the end. So I would like to thank you one more time for this great talk. It was a pleasure listening to you. And I would like to invite you all uh, to join after this talk to the lobby. Uh, Ivan and Amanda will uh, answer your questions. They'll have their tables and they'll stick there for 10, 15 minutes. So if you have any additional questions about their topics, please join them. They'll, they'll be more than glad to answer your questions. And after this, we still have some time for uh, socializing, so yeah, feel free to st stick around and let's enjoy this event. But thank you so much for participating. Thank you.